fantastic. All right, so let me introduce Dr. Oliver Cliff. Uh, as I say, formerly for a postdoc uh, with my group, my team, until uh, March when he's moved across to, to Ben Fulcher's uh, group over at Physics, same university, and incidentally is actually working on a Australian research. No, it's NHMRC, National Health and Medical Research Council, Australia grant with, with now as well. So Oliver, over to you. Thanks, Jeff. <coughs> Great presentation now. Um, so this is, uh, as Joe mentioned, work combined with him and Ben, my new supervisor, as well as Leo and Makshan. Um, and a lot of what we're gonna focus on today is uh, type one and type two areas. So false positives and false negatives. So type one errors, just to refresh everyone's memory, is, uh, is what we have on the left here of a doctor telling an old man that he's pregnant, which clearly isn't, false positive. And uh, type two error is uh, false negative, which we see on the right there. Um, so there's all sorts of reasons as to why we should see a type one error. And one of my favorites is, um, is, is by Tyler Vegan, where he goes through, trawls the internet for ridiculous correlations. Um, for example, total revenue generated by arcades correlating to computer science doctorates or worldwide non-commercial space launches correlating to sociology doctorates. Another doctorate one, civil engineering doctorates um, and consumption of mozzarella cheese, math doctorates and uranium. So these are all obviously ridiculous examples um, which are obtained from p-hacking or just trawling the entire internet and only showing the, the positive correlations that we, that we see there. Um, but there's lots and lots of other causes for false positives that are a little bit less malicious and we see them all the time in neuroscience. Um, some example, some more recent examples are um, due to the spatial order correlation in the brain. You could see spurious correlations there. Um, co-expression. Uh, ben Fulcher worked on co-expression of genes um, for gene set enrichment analysis. Showed that you can get an enormous number of false, false positives very recently. Um, and probably most relevant to this work is uh, looking at the how the temporal order correlation in neuroimaging, such as uh, fMRI, MEG, EEG data actually induces false positives when you're looking at Pearson correlation. It was done by um, Afuni, Steve Smith, and uh, Tom Nichols over at Oxford. <coughs> so a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these studies look into Pearson correlation and how it's affected, um, which is one of the most simple linear dependence measures, but there's a whole lot of other measures that are also affected. Um, some of the more famous ones are canonical correlation analysis, which is uh, a multivariate extension of, of correlations. Um, conditional mutual information, which is just like a, a Pearson correlation, it's undirected, but it also allows for multivariate, just like canonical correlations. Um, and Granger causality, which is a, uh, it allows for directed inference, um, as well as again, multivariate analysis. So <clears throat> in this work, we, uh, we provide the exact null distributions for all of these measures, mutual information, yeah, conditional mutual information and Granger causality specifically, um, under order correlation. So we take um, a lot of this, uh, this analysis on Pearson correlation through to the more advanced measures. Um, so I'll just give a, uh, a case study based on uh, neuroimaging and specifically the Human Connectome Project um, resting state data set. So we're going to look at a absolutely cartoonish example where you take two completely unrelated subjects sampled from the Human Connectome Project resting state at my data set. Um, look at completely random independent regions of their brains um, and sample these time series of the bold data. Um, so the sample size here is 800 samples. Um, I've detrended and z-scored them. And then we'll look at the things like the correlation, mutual information, Granger causality, any kind of famous uh, linear dependence measures that you'd be quite familiar with. So I'll start with uh, a Pearson correlation here. So the idea behind Pearson correlation is to test for a bivariate correlation, so undirected, um, undirected correlation between any of these two sample data sets. Um, the, the typical assumptions are that they are normally distributed um, variables, ID variables, um, and that 
because of this, the null distribution is T distributed. So you can see this T distribution here, and that's when we form a T statistic based on the on the Pearson correlation, the sample Pearson correlation. Okay, so when we get a certain statistic, we'll go up here and, and work out what the actual probability of that of obtaining that statistic or greater was, and then that'll give us a p-value. So taking one minus that will give a p-value. So in the ideal case, if the null distribution is actually t-distributed, then we're going to get this perfect um, diagonal along there. So the p-value CDF is just going to always be this, this diagonal. So taking the, the first sample from the data set, random subject, random region, 800 time points of them, absolutely uncorrelated, we get a t-statistic of around 2.1. So going up here gives us a p-value of around about 0.15 or something like that. Um, so taking our second sample here gives a t-statistic quite a lot higher. Um, so you'd expect this to be definitely on the, on the upper end of the, of the values there. Um, and that, so that gives quite a low p-value, which means it's quite likely that there was actually a correlation there, even though we absolutely know that there wasn't. So what we're carving out here is a empirical conditional probability, uh, conditional distribution, uh, empirical cumulative distribution. Um, so we'd expect, if I get enough samples here, that this is going to track perfectly along this T distribution, as well as this CDF should perfectly track along that diagonal there. But what's happening, as I get this latest T, t statistic, which was a little bit lower, is around about one or so, gets a p-value of about 0.45, um, is that we're, we're actually tracking out an empirical cumulative distribution function quite a lot lower than the actual one. So if I take this all the way to 1,000 um, 1, different trials here, you can see that the empirical CDF is quite a lot lower, which gives us um, nothing like we expect to see uh, as uh, for the p-value CDF. It's not quite along the diagonal at all. So what does this mean in terms of false positive rates? Um, well, we could take the 5% 5% nominal false positive rate, um, and it turns out that we get around about 34% false positives there. Um, so suffice to say that is that is not promising for any of the functional connectivity analysis and a lot of other analysis that we that we use Pearson correlation for in neuroimaging. But that it doesn't just stop at neuroimaging or fMRI data. I'm well aware that a lot of people have all these arguments about fMRI data, but it, this, these kind of issues occur for all sorts of stationary time series, inside and outside of neuroscience. And why does that happen? Stationary time series are relatively simple constructs that are defined by two things, just the mean of the time series and the order covariance. So how a particular point in time depends on every other point in time. Um, so Pearson correlation and any other linear dependence measure um, is scale invariant. So the mean has no effect. So we can pretty much cross out the mean here and focus ourselves on the auto covariance. So if we're, if we're thinking about the auto covariance, that's, that's had quite a long history in, in statistics, uh, look, looking at Pearson correlation particularly or linear dependence um, for an auto correlated time series. And this has been since the work of Ewell and Pearson. This is why they, they started to look into autoregressive models back in the early 20th, early 20th century. And uh, Bartlett came up with quite an elegant solution in around 1935, where he found that um, when you're, you're inferring statistics from autocorrelated time series, uh, the, the sample size isn't what it appears to be. So if you have an autocorrelated times series, then the sample size is either greater than or less than what you actually expect it to be. Um, so when you're looking at actually inferring whether or not these statistics are statistically significant, um, then you need to actually check whether it passes, say for correlation sake, passes the t-test with an effective sample size. So that's it's greater than or less than um, the actual original sample size. Um, another quite popular stream um, was uh, Granger's work um, starting around 1969, um, who defined processes through their own order covariance. So effectively his idea was to, to condition out the relevant history of a process 
um, and look at whether adding in a second process um, improved the pre predictability of it. So the term causal is a little bit sketchy here, but we'll, uh, we'll avoid that topic. Um, but effectively, we have two different approaches here. Bartlett's formula that looks at modifying the statistical tests and Granger causality, which looks at modifying the actual measure that you're using. So I'll start with Bartlett's formula. Um, like I said, Bartlett's formula is, is all about defining an effective sample size. So it gives you a, a stretched or a shrunk um, sample size based on the, the actual data set. So if we look at this, so we, we've got two different univariate time series here, X and Y. This is the autocorrelation function that they carve out. So how much each point in X or Y depends on their own past. So when we filter the data, we get a stretch kind of autocorrelation function. Um, and for a, sorry, for the raw data set, it's, it's um, a lot shorter autocorrelation function effectively. <clears throat> so this effective sample size is really equal to the sample size when you're actually dealing with um, time series data. Effectively, the, the effective sample size is less than the original sample size when both X and Y are autocorrelated. Um, and quite surprisingly, it's greater than the sample size when um, one is positively autocorrelated and one is negative. Uh, so what does this mean when it comes to actually doing st significance testing? If you're testing with the original t-test, as in not including the sample size in this, in, inside the t-distribution here or inside the statistic there, then false positives will occur when both X and Y are positively autocorrelated, so type 1 errors, and false negatives will occur when one is positively autocorrelated and one is negatively autocorrelated. So what happens when we apply this corrected testing to our HCP data set? Well, we get a 5% false positive rate for a normal 5%. So we get carve out this, um, this diagonal here, which is exactly what we want to see. Um, but this is just one linear dependence measure out of a very large family. Like I, I mentioned a couple of them along the way, Granger causality, mutual information, canonical correlation analysis, in particular, in particular, you might want to be looking at a directed linear dependence or a multivariate linear dependence or, or both of those together. So, um, yep, yeah, so, so before I was, uh, I was discussing how we fix uh, linear dependence under autocorrelation, there are two different approaches, Bartlett's formula and Granger causality. I'll just move on to Granger causality now and just give a very high level understanding of whether that fixes um, our false positive rate. Um, so for the exact same test, we're looking at directed predictability now. So Granger causality, I'll give a bit more information later on, but it, in brief, it assumes a, a Markov chain. Uh, so you condition out the past. Here we assume that the past is up to order 50. Um, and Due to Wilkes' theorem, the null distribution is asymptotically chi-square. Don't really need to know exactly what that is, but just effectively that this is what the cumulative distribution function of the chi-square, the appropriate chi-square distribution is. So what happens when we do the exact same um, experiment as before? We actually carve out this, this empirical CDF that still doesn't match the expected CDF which is quite surprising given that Granger causality was intended originally to deal with autocorrelated processes. When in fact, for these real data sets, it gives a 14% false positive rate for the nominal five, um, which is around three times what it should be. Um, so, so that's not good. So how do we, how do we unify Bartlett's formula with these more advanced multivariate measures? such as mutual information and Granger causality. So the advantages of bivariate correlation, which is undirected um, and only handles uh, univariate time series, is that we have the exact test given to the Bartlett. Uh, mutual information gives us an improvement in that it's undirected, but handles multivariate time series. So 
just like Granger causality, mutual information has this asymptotic chi-squared test. So the, these are valid asymptotically, but um, what are the exact tests? Well, there, there are exact F tests that exist for IID variables, that, but that doesn't help us very much when it comes to uh, autocorrelated time series. Um, Granger causality, on the other hand, um, allows for not only multivariate time series, but also directed time series. Um, it also has an asymptotically valid chi-squared test. Um, yeah, it also has an asymptotically uh, valid chi-squared test due to, due to works as well. So how do we go about uh, extending or unifying Bartlett's formula uh, with these kind of more advanced multivariate measures? Well, we start with partial correlation, which is <coughs> effectively um, the same as Pearson correlation, but you're you're conditioning out some kind of concomitant variable, um, and we can derive a one tail test from Bartlett's formula, as I'll go through, um, and then we can obtain an exact two tail test just simply by squaring um, squaring this this one tail test, um, and then we can move on to to dealing with conditional mutual information between two time series which um, have Gaussian marginals. Um, and we can express conditional mutual information as a squared partial correlation, which is a known result, not recently known result. Um, and then using the fact that squared partial correlation tests from before, we, we can simply derive our conditional mutual information test. So for conditional mutual information between multiple time series, we can use the chain rule to decompose this. Um, this measure is a sum of individual CMI terms. And then we can obtain our exact test in the same way that we did above here, except we just summed them all together effectively. Um, so Granger causality, um, Lionel Barnett showed back in 2009 um, that Granger causality is equivalent to conditional mutual information. So we can use that result and use our previous um, exact test for conditional mutual information um, for Granger causality. All right, so let's start with uh, a partial correlation. So partial correlation um, is obtained through taking a residual of, of both processes. So we're interested in the partial correlation between X and Y given the, some concomitant variable W here. So we take the residuals and then the partial, sample partial correlation is given by the sum of squares um, of both residuals, uh, sorry, both processes on the top divided by the sum of squares of each process independently, each of those residual processes independently. <clears throat> so for IID variables, it's known how to, how to test for this. Uh, you test it against student's T distribution, um, where the degree of freedom is given by the sample size minus the dimension of the conditional, so the dimension of this, um, this W process, um, minus two. And the two is to account for intercept and some sampling, um, sampling bias. So for autocorrelated processes, it's a simple step to sub in what we had before, the sample size with the effective sample size now. But interestingly, the, the effective sample size here is, is computed with respect to the residuals of those processes. So not the original processes, but residuals of X given W and Y given W. Uh, we still have this conditional dimension of the conditional in here. So everything else is, is exactly the same, except that the, um, the Bartlett correction is now, or the effective sample size is now on the residuals. Okay, so let's give our, um, our effective degrees of freedom a name. I'll just label it N, X, Y here. Um, so in order to obtain the, the two-tailed test for partial correlation, we square this statistic on both sides. So squaring this here, simply squaring a, a T distribution simply becomes an F distribution. Um, you can look at our paper for a bit more details, but we, we get a form like this. So the statistic on the left-hand side um, is simply obtained by squaring what we originally had up here. And on the right hand side, now we have an F distribution with the effective degrees of freedom rather than the degrees of freedom. Okay. So for now, 
we'll, we'll pause and I'll, I'll introduce a, a new distribution that I'm going to use throughout the rest of the paper, which we refer to as the L distribution. Um, and it'll it'll become quite clear as to why we're why we're introducing a completely different distribution that we need to actually Monte Carlo sample rather than analytically derive. So we take our squared statistic um, from uh, the partial correlation, the squared partial correlation Butler corrected statistic. Um, transform it through a log, uh, adding this this effective degrees of freedom on the bottom. And the reason for that is that by doing this transformation, we can turn um, our squared statistic into something that's equivalent to a conditional mutual information. So on the right-hand side, this is equivalent to conditional mutual information. This has been known for a little while now. And we'll label this statistics null distribution the, the L distribution. So we, we could derive this distribution analytically because it's simply just a transformation of the F distribution. But for our purposes, what we're going to do is, is sample this distribution every time. So we sample a whole lot of F distributed variables, divide them by N plus one, take, it, take the log, and that's how we form our um, empirical cumulative distribution function. Um, and the reason for that is because higher dimensional measures uh, such as mutual information for multivariates and Granger causality are intractable. Um, so we define our L distribution for univariates like this, and then simply our L distribution for multivariate or for multiple effective uh, degrees of freedom is um, a sum of these log F distributed variables. <clears throat> okay, so it's it's important to note that this this term inside the log here is potentially different for each of these L distributed variables. Um, so it wasn't quite as analytically, it, it's not analytically tractable like it was in the simple case um, of the univariate measures. Okay, so taking our L distribution and the two-tailed uh, t-test, uh, Butler corrected t-test for partial correlation, we can then work work out what the exact tests are for conditional mutual information. So for conditional mutual information between univariate Gaussians, uh, it's actually, uh, like I mentioned a few times, it's equivalent to squared, squared partial correlation taken inside this log. Uh, so we take the two, up, two over this side and then it becomes this term that we actually knew about before. Um, this was, uh, so far as we know, first shown by Davy in 2013. Um, and typically the null distribution is considered to be asymptotically chi-squared. Um, so if the dimension of X is K, dimension of Y is L, dimension of the concomitant variable is C, um, it's chi-squared distributed. Uh, the, the conditional mutual information is chi-squared distributed with K times L parameters. Um, so the exact null distribution for this is, uh, is known to be F distributed as long as the variables are I, D. So it's important to note the distinction between the chi-squared asymptotic distribution and the F distribution, which is, which is exact for I, D variables in that you don't have a conditional here. Um, no, suffice to say that the distributions are, are different for a small number of samples. Um, but the null, the, you don't have a conditional or this C value in the chi-squared distribution and it does exist in the F distribution here. So we obtained the exact conditional mutual information tests by simply using our L distribution from before. All we do is take the, the two multiplied by the uh, uh, the conditional mutual information term by two, and that gives us a statistic that is exactly L distributed. Um, so we'll now just verify that these actually work using some uh, independent first order autoregressive processes. So some numerical simulations where we can really uh, push, push these processes to their limits and, and verify that uh, whilst the null hypothesis still holds that there is the, the processes are completely independent. Um, so what we do is we generate uh, independent first order autoaggressive processes, X, Y, and W, 
uh, in each one of these experiments, we generated 512 samples. Just remember that uh, dimension of X is K, dimension of Y is L, and dimension of W is C. Um, in order to really drive that, that order correlation up, we digitally filter um, with an IAR and an FIR filter um, for each one of these experiments. And by doing so, we increase the filter order, uh, increasing the filter order, sorry, increases the order correlation function. Um, so it decreases the effective sample size. Um, now we, we could choose the order aggressive parameters so that we simply increase the order correlation function, but uh, filtering with an IR and FIR filter is a pretty common pre-processing step in neuroscience. So we we decided to go for that option. Um, so in each one of these experiments, we perform 100 trials of each configuration in order to obtain the false positive rate in the same way as I've discussed before. So <clears throat> in our first numerical simulation, um, we performed mutual information tests for two time series, mutual information between two time series. Uh, we simulated um, X and Y were both, like I said, independent univariate processes, K and L both one, and uh, there was no conditional process, but a variable filter order. So increasing this filter order increase, in general increases the order correlation. So the two tests that we performed were the LR test, which are the asymptotically valid ones that I mentioned, and the exact test, which um, I've just introduced. Um, so you can see that the, the, both the FIR and IAR increase the false positive rate. FIR and IR filters increase the false positive rate to more than 15%, which is three times the nominal value. Um, interestingly, we have this um, effective sample size uh, greater than the original sample size here with, a, with no filter order. Um, and so in that case, we actually end up with a false we, we end up with more false negatives than we would expect, and we have tested that in the paper and have results there on the type two errors. Um, but crucially, our, our tests stay within the um, confidence intervals that we'd expect from binomial. <clears throat> so moving on to conditional mutual information. So before we had um, unconditional mutual information, now, now we've got the same processes uh, independent univariate processes that are generated with a now uh, conditional uh, process W, which is also univariate and still with this variable filter order that goes between um, no filter at zero um, up to 32, uh, I think it was, filter order. Um, relative to the previous results, we only see this slight increase in the LR test due to the conditional not being taken into account, if you recall. Um, in the car squared distribution. Whereas again, our exact tests stay within the, the bounds that we, the confidence intervals that we'd expect. Okay, moving on. Um, the, we, we also perform a simulation where X and Y are again, independent univariate processes, but y, uh, we increase the dimension of the conditional process, W, between one and 200 um, independent time series. Um, so because we're in increasing the dimension of the uh, conditional process, we're fixing to an eighth order filter here. And what happens is we see this approximately linear increase in the false, false positive rate of the LR test um, due to this increase in the, the conditional process. Um, and that's, again, simply because the, the asymptotic chi-square distribution does not account for um, any, any conditional, any C. So you can see that it's linear increase and it's gonna keep increasing, but we decided to stop it at um, more than 40% false positive rate C because 200 there. Okay, so that's, um, that's conditional mutual information between two time series. Uh, how do we handle this when there's multiple time series? So that is multiple processes. We're looking at the conditional mutual information between everything in X here, which is multiple, and everything in Y there, which has multiple time series as well. Um, so in this case, the more general form of conditional mutual information is that it's expressed as a log likelihood of some squared residuals. Um, and again, it's tested against the chi-squared distribution. 
where k is the number, uh, uh, is the dimensionality of x and l is the dimensionality of y. <coughs> so in order to obtain our exact test here, we uh, decompose conditional mutual information by the chain rule, which ends up as these k times l sums here. It doesn't really matter in which order you decompose them. The most important part here is that we, we have k by l um, independent conditional mutual informations. Um, and because of that, we can obtain an expression as squared partial correlations, um, which then is going to be L distributed under the null. So each, each one of these is going to be an L distribution. And as I mentioned before, when we sum L distributions, we obtain an L distribution. So we can Monte Carlo sample each one of those in the same way that we did for all the previous ones. Okay, so just remember that each term could have a different effective sample size, which is why we introduced this L distribution um, and can't actually analytically derive it and need to do Monte Carlo sampling. Um, so each one of these effective degrees of freedom n um, is the effective sample size, which is the residuals, the, the, uh, the effective sample size of the residuals. Um, and then you take away the dimension of the conditional and then take away two again for the intercept and for the bias correction. Um, so we performed some numerical simulations um, for mutual information with multiple time series um, with X and Y both independent um, and K equals L, um, but we're driving up now the dimension of both X and Y. Um, fixing it in an eighth order filter with no conditional process. So what we see is that the chi-squared distribution linearly increases again um, because each uh, the chi-squared distribution doesn't count for the Bartlett correction nor the conditional. Um, and it, as you can see there, it's, it's approaching 100% for both FIR and IR filters. Okay, finally, Granger causality. So Granger causality as I mentioned before, is, is defined in terms of uh, um, two Markov chains. So you've got your X and your Y Markov chain here. Um, and how you infer the the order of those Markov chains, um, uh, people have lots of different approaches. Use the archaic information criterion, the Bayesian information criterion, first minimum partial order correlation, all, all these different approaches. But effectively, you end up with um, a, a P order Markov process for X and a Q order marker process for Y. Um, and you can then express Granger causality as a conditional mutual information um, as, as indicated in this diagram here. So you, you, take, um, you take the mutual information between your predictee variable, the one that you're interested in and your predictor variable and then condition out the predictees past. So this gives you a directed, um, directed predictability um, of y to x. Um, equivalently, you can express it as a log ratio of the sum of squares. We don't actually use this uh, this expression in this paper. We we focus on the um, of Barnett's derivation that it's a conditional mutual information. <coughs> so Granger causality is typically assumed to be asymptotically chi-squared distributed. So we've got here, so multiply the Granger causality estimate by T, and then that's that's chi-squared distributed. In this case, uh, you've got the dimension of X multiplied by the dimension of Y multiplied by the dimension of the predict D um, Q order. So there is an exact test, um, but in this work, we show that that exact test which, um, so there's, there's an exact F test uh, that's typically used in the literature, but in this work we show that the, the exact test is only valid for IID variables, um, which uh, doesn't quite work given that Granger causality is defined in terms of autocorrelated processes X and Y. So there's a very niche case in which uh, the F test will actually work for Granger causality. So how do we derive our exact Granger causality test? Well, it's it's again through a decomposition 
Oh, so for two time series, we can decompose it into Q conditional mutual information terms via the chain rule. Um, and then that simply using our previous results in conditional mutual information gives the L distribution um, under the null hypothesis. Again, it's important to note that each one of these Q terms has a different, could have a different um, effective sample size. So um, we go through and use our same Monte Carlo sampling um, and everything like that. This effective sample size again, uh, sorry, effective degree of freedom again is, is computed from effective sample size minus the conditional minus two. So in order to test how Granger causality performs um, under quarter, quarter correlation, um, we simulate um, X and Y. Uh, we, we go back to our original simulation for mutual information, simulate X and Y as independent univariate processes, K and L equals one, and no conditional process. So we, in this case, we, we increase the, the filter order. So this was a test that's very similar to one done by um, Lionel Barnett a couple of years ago. Um, which originally introduced us to the work, and we find similar results to him in that as you increase the uh, filter order for both IAR and FIR filters, even though we're choosing the optimal history lengths, uh, the chi-squared distribution does not perform particularly well. Um, so we can see this, this uh, false positive rate of the chi-squared distribution, or the LR test, if you will, um, approaching 100% um, for um, the for the IR filtered data set and pretty consistently above 90% there. So uh, we, we've also done another test where we, so that was with fixing the optimal filter order. In this case, we're, we're going to fix, so that was with fixing the optimal history length. In this case, we're going to fix a filter order, an eighth order filter, and increase the predictor history to just see how that affects um, affects our results and uh, maintain a history length of p equals one of, of the, the the x x marker process to one. Um, as we increase the the predictor order aggressive order, effectively capturing all the causality. <laughs> if you will, um, then the false positive rate increases almost linearly here um, with Q, due simply to the fact that there's no conditional in the asymptotic chi-squared test, whereas again, our exact test maintains um, the correct false positive rate. All right, moving on to how we handle uh, Kranger causality for multiple time series. It's very similar to before, um, but instead of a sum over Q independent conditional mutual information terms, we have Q by K by L conditional mutual information terms. So K again is the dimension of X, L is the dimension of Y, Q is the history length of the predicting um, predictor. Um, so you have quite a large number of terms, um, which turns into an exact test, uh, exact distribution under the null, uh, exact L distribution under the null um, with that many terms, K by L by Q, um, effective degrees of freedom. So just remember, again, that each one of these terms has a different, could have a different effective degree of freedom. Um, so in order to test this, uh, see, see how the increasing the dimension affects um, the Granger causality test. We simulate X and Y as multivariate processes where K and L are both greater than or equal to one uh, without a conditional process and a fixed eighth order filter, FIR and IAR filter. So because there's so many terms and we only have a sample size of 512, um, we choose the optimal P um, but fix Q as one. Um, and as we do that, we can see that the likelihood ratio test increases almost towards 100% again um, for the IAR filter. Um, for the most part, our exact um, tests are within the confidence bounds, but what happens around uh, dimension uh, K and L equals three 
um, for the IAR uh, filter is that the regressions, uh, they become rank deficient. So we can't actually perform any of our um, cor independent correlations or partial correlations anymore, um, which is, we think, quite a useful, useful result in that you can tell when you don't have enough data effectively um, to compute Granger causality there. So just returning to the human connectome project case study that um, I introduced at the start for Pearson correlation. Um, we had, I think I showed the Granger causality results for um, optimal embedding, which was around 16%. Um, with our exact test, we've, we've fixed these um, multivariate, uh, mutual information for multivariate time series or multiple time series. Uh, originally, it was 83% for the human connectome project. Uh, now we reduced it to 5.2%. Um, and mutual information between univariates was originally 45.6% false positive rate. We reduced this down to 6.1%. So we're fairly confident that um, these results uh, are showing that um, we've introduced a new type of Bartlett formula for multivariate measures. Some of the take-home messages are that we have, uh, there are co many commonly used linear dependence measures that exhibit bias um, for autocorrelation, co correlated time series, Pearson correlation, mutual information, Granger causality. Uh, we represent these measures as sums of squared partial correlations in order to derive their exact sampling distribution. And before I work, uh, they will, the distributions were only known asymptotically. Thanks. And I'll just leave you briefly with terrible photos of my collaborators. <laughs> Leo, Ben, Mac, and Joe. Joe, you should love that one, right? That's, uh, that is the most public forum you've used uh, that photo of me on so far. <laughs> so I'm not even sure I want to applaud now, but I will anyway, just to be nice. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Oliver. Uh, so, um, no one's asked a question in the uh, in the forum. I know all the answers here. Or, well, uh, not a, that's not 100% true. I know most of the answers. Oliver knows all the answers. Uh, so, we're, we're slightly behind on the on the session anyway. We've probably got time for one question. I'll wait uh, a couple of seconds to see if one comes through. And if it doesn't, I will ask a, a brief one. Um, Okay, I'm going to ask you one anyway, and we'll see if one comes through while I'm asking. Thanks, uh, Oliver, is there open source software available to uh, run uh, <laughs> your correction for autocorrelation on Granger causality, mutual information? Yes, so I completely forgot to put that in. I was meant to put it in yesterday. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> um, there is, uh, if you go to the archive, we have it on the archive paper, right, Joe? I believe so. Yeah, okay. Um, so there's the link in the description of this paper, um, uh, description of this presentation to uh, the archive paper, which has the GitHub um, GitHub repo that I have all the code on. So the yeah. code, um, it, it's a MATLAB code that looks really similar to what you're quite used to. The CORR function from MATLAB, you just get out a measure and a p-value, it's quite easy to use. Um, and it's got all the code that we, we have in the demos here and the examples, HCP, as well as the numerical simulations. Yeah. And while we're in code, uh, why is it that there's a separate toolbox that does this and it hasn't been integrated into JODT, which we had a lovely tutorial on at CNS a few days ago? <laughs> I mean, some people disagree with Java. Um, I'm not going to name <laughs> names. Um, some prefer <laughs> Python or, you know, <laughs> Suffice to say, it's coming, but I'll have to do it myself. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Excellent. No, that, unless unless anyone think. in the crowd wants to wants to practice their Java. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's leave it there. I say we're a little bit over time anyway. Uh, so we'll thank Oliver again. <laughs>